Romans chapter number six. Y'all feeling good? Oh, it's a good time to be saved. Romans chapter six, verse number one. For the sake of time, we'll put it on the board. If you don't mind kind of going along with it, I want everybody to really put your attention on the Bible. Okay, put your attention on what God's word says. It's so much better than men's words. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? What shall we say then? Shall we go on living in lukewarmness? Shall we go on living ungodly? Shall we go on living in this world where we're one foot in the, wor- in the church, one foot in the world? Should we go on doing whatever we want to do more than what he wants us to do? And then it says, by no means. Somebody shout, by no means. By no means. One translation says, God forbid. Heavens forbid. No way, no how. Meaning that my past is in my past. I'm ready for God to do a new thing in me. And it says that we are those who died to sin. How can we live any longer in it? So the best way for you to get free from sin is that you can't just resist it. You got to die to it and be found in Jesus. And it says, or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus was baptized into his what? Death. Now underline that if you're a note taker, all right? Please underline that because that's a weird statement that we've been baptized into death. We're going we're gonna to kind of flush this out for a moment. It says, we therefore were buried with him. Go on through baptism into death, that in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And so it says that we've been buried with him through this baptism into death, and it's only when we're buried with him will we experience a new new life. Now I want to prophesy over you that God wants you to live a new life. The new life is for you. You don't want to just live your old life. You want to live this new life, this abundant life that is found in Christ Jesus. You want to be identified with his resurrection. But before you're identified with the resurrection power of God, you first have to be buried with Christ. Today's message is entitled, Buried with Christ. And the subtopic is eight things you must know about water baptism. Come on, somebody. I want to take a moment today to put some reverence, put some respect on water baptism. I know many of you all have heard about water baptism before. And you don't really understand what baptism is. I know I was there for many years, and I want to help you guys today. Quick survey. How many of you all was, was baptized as a kid? They threw you in the pool, and you ain't know what was happening. Anybody here? All of y'all. All of y'all went to the same church where they just, and you were just, you were in the water, and you were just smiling like, oh, I don't know, you know. And then afterwards, you know, people celebrated you, and you was like, but you really didn't know what. How many of you all went to the church where they sprinkled you? Let me see by show of hands. You sprinkled. You got sprinkled. Praise God for you. How many of you all didn't grow up in church at all? Or maybe you went to church for a while, but you, didn't, you still don't know what water baptism is, right? You don't really understand it. I mean, you might think that it's a good thing. It's something that other people do, but you don't really know that it's for you. And my name is Ken, and I'm your friend, and I want to help you on today. I got baptized when I was 11 years old. Um, I grew up in a, a church called New Hope Baptist Church, okay? And uh, we placed a great emphasis on baptism. I mean, it's in the name, New Hope Baptist Church. So we, of course, in the Baptist denomination, we love to baptize people, and we place a great emphasis on it. And um, it's a very good thing. So um, when when I was 11 years old, it was my 11th birthday. I'm sitting in the balcony of the church, and um, the preacher would put out a chair and say, will there be one? That day, my birthday, 11 years old, I decided to be the one that day. And I really didn't understand salvation. We actually made more of an emphasis on baptism than salvation. I didn't understand redemption. I didn't understand that I was giving up my life for the life that Jesus had for me. I didn't understand what it meant to be born again. I just, but I did understand this, that I was taking a step towards God. And in my 11-year-old mind, I just knew that I was taking a step towards God. But unfortunately, because I really didn't understand baptism or salvation for the next season of my life that I lived as a Christian atheist because I really didn't understand that which I participated in. And what I've realized is that there's many of you all who've been water baptized and you didn't know what happened to you. You just knew that somebody told you that that's what you were supposed to do and you did it and thank God for that step. Thank God that sometimes we just need to follow other people who went before us. But today I want you to get a level of revelation. And so what does it mean to be baptized? For those of you all who are note takers, write this down. The word baptize, can I do some teaching today? It means to dip, dunk, immerse, or cover wholly in. Okay, that's what it means to be baptized. To dip, dunk, immerse, or cover wholly in. And the Bible speaks about three different baptisms. 
Okay, number one, the baptism into the body of Christ, which is your salvation. Number two is the baptism into the Holy Spirit where you get power from on high. And number three is this water baptism, which is an outward sign of an inward experience. Okay, so there's three different baptisms. However, some would kind of um, fall into contradiction with that because of Ephesians chapter four, verse five. Now, Ephesians four, five says this, that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so if you go home and you read that, you'll say, well, pastor, I thought you said it was three baptisms, but here the Bible says that it's one baptism. And I always say this, and this is very important when it comes to you reading your Bible. To understand the text, you first have to understand the pretext and the post-text to put the text into context. Let me not be complicated. In, in order to understand what God means here, read the scriptures before and read the scriptures after to make sure you don't take that scripture out of context. That's how people set up weird stuff and doctrines that was never in the Bible, like women can't preach because it says women keep silent in the church. Well, that is a text, but put it in the context. There was women prophetesses, women deaconesses. There was women rulers in Israel. There was women. God used women. There was a woman apostle. And so obviously that text doesn't mean what you're saying. It means something else. And really it's just basic hermeneutics. Now, everybody who studies the Bible, you need just a basics of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the proper translation of Scripture, meaning that from Genesis to, to Revelation, what is the spirit of the Scripture? So it's easy to take one statement out of context if you don't understand the spirit of Scripture. And when you look at the spirit or the hermeneutics of the word, you will find out that the Bible over and over talks about multiple baptisms. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, if you read the verses before, Paul is addressing unity. He is addressing a church that is divided in doctrine, and he begins a message about unity, saying there's one ordination, there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, and I don't know if it was the baptism into the body of Christ, the baptism in the water, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He was just saying, whatever it is, it's one. We're one in this. So the message or the text is about unity. But I want to show you hermeneutically what the Bible says about baptisms. Hebrews chapter 6, are you all okay today? Yeah. Verse number one, it says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, meaning that there are elementary things when it comes to your relationship with Jesus that you need to master and settle it. Yes. Meaning that you should not be in kindergarten for the next 10 years spiritually. You should, not, you should not be in elementary school for the next 25 years because you have failed to get off the, I would say nipple, but I don't know, get off the bottle and grow up from infancy, come on somebody, into middle school, high school and collegiate activity. They ain't ready yet. <laughs> so it actually says, let us leave the discussion of those elementary principles. Let us go on into what? Perfection. That means maturity. That means that you're in this church because God wants us to grow up. Yeah. We're not here to preach your favorite message and for you to hear your favorite song. We're here to equip you to do the work of the ministry so we can bring the gospel to all of the nations. All of y'all in here are called. We're going to a whole nother level. And so it says, and here's the foundational thing. Not laying again, because that's how you feel as a preacher. We got to go over this again. How many times I got to counsel you again? You still keep sinning again and again and again, just like your kids. Like how many times I got to tell you to clean your room again? How many times I got to tell you to turn off the lights again, right? Not laying again, the foundation of what? Repentance of dead works, that's foundational. Faith towards God, that's foundational. The doctrine, which is the teachings of baptisms. 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 Not baptism, plural, baptisms. What's that? That is a nod towards the baptisms, right? And so here, you can look at it when you get home, but there's three baptisms. Baptism into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is an example. Baptism into the Holy Spirit, which we all need, Acts chapter 10, verse 47. Baptism in the water, what we're talking about today, Mark chapter 1, verse 8. Stay with me. I believe that there are many people who struggle in their Christianity because they don't have all three baptisms. I've been in ministry over two decades, been pastoring going on 17 years now. And whenever I see carnality, which is fleshy behavior that has not been redeemed yet, most of the time, if you do a check, somebody's missing a baptism. Are y'all with me? Meaning that you might have one, but you don't have three. You might have two baptisms, but you haven't had all three. And God knows that we need all three baptisms. For 10 plus years of my life, I lived as a Christian atheist. I define that as a person who believes in God, but lives like he doesn't exist. Anybody ever been there before? You might be there right now. If you ask me, do you believe in God? 
I would say, quite certainly I do, but you could not tell it in my behavior. I, I, I acted like everybody else act, drank like they drank, slept around like they slept around. But if you were to ask me, do I believe in God? I would say yes. I was a Christian atheist. I, I believed in God, but I lived like he didn't exist. What was my problem? I missed the baptism. I didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I got water baptized when I was 11. I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit when I was 23 years old. And from that point, that's when all of the, <laughs> the garbage began to fall out of my life. Because many of you all, you got a gun, but you ain't got no bullets in it. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need all three baptisms. Let me move on. Are y'all with me? Yeah. And so what does the Bible say about baptism? Matthew 3, 16. Let's just do a Bible workout. If you're ready, say I'm, work I'm ready. Hey. All right, Matthew chapter 3. Let's go. As soon as Jesus was what? Baptized. Jesus was what? Oh, Lord, he went out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was what? Open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. That means the Spirit of God fell on Jesus after his water baptism. Now, as a side note, I think it's interesting that right after Jesus' water baptism, he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the same time. And you will see this going through scriptures as we go through them. You'll see these two things being very close together. Not something that you got to wait six months or 12 months or for some people and not for others. No, this is something that goes very close together. Now, what I really want you to get out of Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 is that Jesus was baptized. Now, how many of you all here love Jesus? Let me see by a show of hands if you love the Lord. How many of you all feel like he is our example setter? Like what he do, we do. Now, I know some of you all, you have WWJD bracelets on and bumper stickers, but you don't do what Jesus would do. If Jesus was baptized, you need to be baptized too. No, really. Some people are like, I don't know about that. You know, I just did my hair. We don't care about your hair. God gave you your hair. He can also take it away. We are baptized because Jesus was baptized. And then he commands us to follow his lead. So even if you don't understand it, I'm going to do what the man told me to do because obedience is better than sacrifice. Let's go over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Watch this one here. Acts chapter 2, Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, not just a few of you, but everybody who's here, no matter your age, your background, how much money you make, everybody, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive what? The gift of the, once again, water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament early church were two things that went together. There's a reason they went together, right? But I love this part because this is not a suggestion. This is not like get baptized if you understand it or get baptized if you want to or get baptized. You know, because a lot of people say, well, I would get baptized, but my grandmama's not here and I want her to see me. What's your grandmama got to do with you obeying God? Come on. Come on. They say, well, I would get baptized, but you know, right now, you, you know, you make up so many excuses, but the command is repent and be baptized. Yeah. Repent. Yeah. Repent and be baptized. There's no, like every one of you, like everybody who, set, who calls on the name of Jesus, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your education, doesn't matter your race or your ethnicity, doesn't matter what you did last night, he says repent and be baptized. All of you all do like this and say, this is for me. Acts, um, go to the next one, Acts chapter uh, number two, I think we're there, verse 41. Let's go to that one. It says, and those who accepted his message were baptized. There was about 3,000 of them. They were added to the number in a day. Woo. And they devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. Go back to verse 41. Oh, is it up still? Okay, leave that up. I believe we're in this day and time where we're going to see 3,000 people added to the church. Now, some of you all are shouting, but you couldn't handle that. Because right now you're complaining about where you're parking at. All right? And it's amazing to me the people who have been praying for revival, but how a revival will offend you when it really shows up. And some of you all will start praying about another church just because you got to walk a little bit further, and that should not be. You know, there are many people that you don't mind parking far when you go to Disney. Let me go on this side. This side ain't ready yet. I, 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 I'm, saying, I'm just saying by experience. I was at Universal last night, and by the time I got into the park, I said, it's time to go home. I, I mean, listen, by the time I walked, I walked so far. Me and my son, we rode two rides, and we came on back home, right? But it's amazing how many of you all would go and spend hundreds of dollars and walk for miles to see a mouse or to ride the Hulk, but you wouldn't do it if there was a move of God. 
and you will start complaining about you ain't able to get in here. You know what that means to me? Is that you don't want to walk with Jesus. Because if you walk with Jesus, there was always a crowd around Jesus. They had to tear the roof off to get to the man. They had to, come on, they had to go through the press for the woman who had the issue of blood to reach for the hem of his garment. See, wherever there is a crowd, it's because God is moving. And it's actually what we want. So I am kind of sneakily believing for 3,000 people to be added to the church. Exponential growth. That means that we need seven services, 10 campuses. I'm talking about exponential growth. Can you imagine that baptism line? If you was number 3,000, some of y'all would have missed it. You wouldn't be baptized. Because you would miss the football game. 2,999. I got 2,998. Oh, 2,997. I'm going to get baptized today. It's important to me, right? But I love this because what I see in the book of Acts is how the modern church should be. We cannot reduplicate culturally everything from the book of Acts but we have to pull principles and we need the spirit of the early church. The spirit of the early church wasn't just here to be comfortable and convenient, to teach me a good message, Mr. Pastor. They wanted signs and miracles and wonders and actually the shadow of Peter would fall on the sick and people would be healed because they carried a collective presence of God. If God did it before, I need you to know that he wants to do it now and he wants to do it with us. If you understand about our church, we're creating an atmosphere where heaven can kiss earth. One of the things that we're trying to create here is just where there's not visitation, but there's habitation. I pray this morning, God, as people get out of their car over at cons, let them be healed because they're on their way to the glory house. Am I by myself? I don't know about y'all up there, but for this house, we're going to serve the Lord. I want the kabod of God, the glory of the Lord in the place. 3,000 was added, but watch what it says in verse number 42, if you don't mind, because this is what we need. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, so every exponential growth, if you really want to see revival, you need five ingredients. Number one, you need baptism, because it all started from baptism. Baptism is the foundational teaching. Baptism is where everything else starts from. And so you have baptism, put up my five very quickly. These are the five things, the steward and move of God. You need baptism, everybody say baptism. Baptism. You need to be devoted to Pastor Ken, I mean the apostles' teaching. No, for real though. Some of you, like really, some of you all, you judge what we say by somebody you don't know that has no fruit on Facebook. What in the world is wrong with us? We need to be devoted to spiritual leaders who's been preaching for decades and have a good marriage and they have fruit in their life. Come on, we all need mentorship. We need somebody that will speak into our life. We can't get rid of that. I know you got, I know you saved and you don't need anybody to be saved and the Holy Ghost can help you, but you need, you need mentorship. We need disciples that make disciples, disciples that are being made and also making disciples. So you need devotion to the apostles' teaching. Fellowship, God knows that's why we have small groups because you're not supposed to do your Christianity by yourself. You need other relationships. We need communion. Now we do communion and every Wednesday, glory to God, and every midweek we break bread together. What does communion do? It puts us in remembrance of the price that was paid for us on the cross because many times we forget. And number five, we need prayer. And that's why we pray for you every Sunday. That's why we have a prayer team on Wednesdays and midweek and we pray for the healing, for, for people to be healed and all these things because these are the five things that sustain the move of God. Now I got to move on because y'all, y'all not ready. (laughs) Acts 16, verse 31. And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. It's not hard to be saved, right? I just led a friend of mine to Jesus. We went to college together and he called me this, this, he's like, I'm in a season of my life. He says, I don't know anybody in this world that I can call other than you. And I led him to the Lord and he prayed the prayer of salvation. He said, is that all? I just gotta pray. It's like, yeah, that's all. Just pray and believe. Turn you to Jesus. And that's all it is. You believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. You and your household. Not just you. But salvation should hit your cousins and your auntie and them, your grandma, everybody. God's waiting on you. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and he washed their wounds. But please pay attention to this part. It says, then immediately, somebody shout immediately. immediately. Somebody shout immediately. Immediately. He and all of his household were baptized. What would happen today if we saw families get baptized? You thought you were making a decision for you, but your kids and your grandkids followed you and your grandparents followed you. 
and your cousins and your aunties and everybody, I mean whole households. That's what happens when 3,000 people get added to the church in one day. What God started in you now flows over into the people that you love. Acts chapter 18, verse 8, it says that Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul, they believed and were baptized. Now, what I'm doing is going through the book of Acts, which sets the pace of the modern church today. Y'all with me? When you read Acts, don't say that was some, peop- some old people a long time ago. That was an example of how the Holy Spirit still wants to move today. Amen. Okay? There was baptism, then there was movement. But what I want you to park on and see now is how fast people was baptized. One scripture in Acts says immediately. This one here says they believed and were baptized. Almost like conjunction, junction, what's your function? <laughs> Those two things almost went together. Like they believed and were baptized. It wasn't like they believed and then they prayed and waited for a quarter or waited for 12 months or waited for 24 months or just waited until their friends got baptized. They believed and were baptized. I want you to put some emphasis on the expediency of the transaction. There's something that we all need that we get out of baptism. And so it needs to be done as soon as we possibly can. Acts 9 and 17, it says, and then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on who? Now, y'all remember the story, Saul was crazy. And he was committing Christians to be stoned and put into prison and and killed. God's about to change Saul into a Paul. He sends Ananias to him and he says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, whom appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me to you so that you can see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, notice he actually received the baptism of the Holy Spirit before he even received water baptism. Ananias, and it says immediately, somebody shout immediately, verse 18, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. There are spiritual scales on the unbeliever's eyes. They are good people, but they don't see spiritually. I believe we're coming into a season where God is going to open the eyes of people that have been spiritually blind, people that you love, you know, and you work with. Now, don't allow their hate on you because you see what they don't see to prevent you from walking with sight. The blind lead the blind, both will fall into a ditch. One of the first things that God does is he fills them with the Holy Spirit, scales fall off, and he's like, oh my God, and watch what happens. And he got up, and he was baptized. He didn't go to class for this one. He didn't have to go to Jerusalem University to learn how to be baptized. The man, come on somebody, was treacherous one day, blind that day, received the Holy Ghost, got up, and was baptized. There's a scripture where there was this eunuch, and he was reading the book of Isaiah, and he didn't understand what he was reading. Philip comes up on him in a chair, and he's like, what you reading? And he's like, I'm reading this Isaiah. Philip breaks it down for him. And as soon as he gives his heart to Jesus, the next thing they say is, where is water? Because we're going to get baptized. They didn't wait for months or quarters or years. As soon as he got saved, the next thing they wanted to do was get in the water because there is an anointing on the water. There is something that happens in the water that will not happen if you don't get in the water. God. Uh, uh, uh. So Acts 22 and 16, it says, watch this. Let's read Acts 22 and 16. Ready, Ready to go? So what are you waiting for? Please ask your neighbor, what are you waiting for? It says, get up. I love the command. Get up. Somebody shout, get up. up. Be baptized and wash your sins away. Calling on his name. Now, class, what hinders people from being baptized? Fear. Everybody say fear. fear. And do you know that fear is so relevant or so saturated in our current culture that fear can be baked into your personality and you think it's just you and it's actually the spirit of fear? There's so many people that are walking by fear today and they say, well, that's just me. That's just my personality. No, it ain't. It's a spirit of fear that has been baked into your personality and now you have settled into walking by fear. But as a believer, you've been called to walk by faith and not by sight for the just shall live by faith. And anything that's not done in faith is sin. It's not fear. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of sound mind. 
And they say things like, you know, well, you know, I'm just not dating right now. I'm working on myself. Maybe. Maybe that's true. Or maybe you're just scared to let anybody in. Maybe you're just scared to be hurt again. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it's this. I'm not here to tell you what it is, but I'm saying don't walk by fear when you've been called to walk by faith. People say, well, I'm not tithing. I'm not giving it right now. God knows my heart. Really? Maybe. Or maybe you're just stingy. Maybe you trust more in your ability in driving an Uber in the evening than you do giving God the first and the best so he can bless the rest. Just maybe you walking by fear instead of walking by faith. My name is Ken and I'm your friend. Some of you all got a call of God on your life. And I'm looking straight in the white of your eyes. Who are you? Go ahead and ask your neighbor, is he talking to you? Go ahead and answer them. Answer them. Says, yes, he is talking to me. I got a call of God on my life. And some of y'all been running from the call. You just been running from the call like you can outrun the hand of God. You say, well, you know, I'm just busy right now. I don't know if I can do ALI. I don't know if I can do all that. And maybe, or maybe you're just scared to give your life up to Jesus because you think that your way is better than his way. Maybe it's just fear. When it comes to water baptism, there are so many people that you have a fear of the water. Some of y'all are afraid. You know I'm talking to you. You're afraid of the water. And actually, God is asking you to be water baptized to help you get over that fear. Just like you don't have a a fear of taking a shower, you should not have a fear of getting water baptized. Now, if you got a fear of taking a shower, come come down to the altar and you're going to cast that demon out of you in the name of Jesus. Some people have a fear. You got a fear. You got to get over that fear. What is another reason? What about pride? Everybody say pride. Pride. Why don't people get baptized? Pride. Because you got to humble yourself to get wet in front of everybody. And it's amazing that before God exalts you, he first asks you to humble yourself. And some of you all are so prideful because it's in our culture. You're not a bad person, but you just got your master's degree and you got your PhD and you make six figures. You got a social media following and you think you all that. I love you, you know. But the truth is, if you don't humble yourself, you're going to be humble. And I love it, Jesus. He's the Christos, Emmanuel, the Christ, the son of the living God, the king of glory. Everything that is made was made by him, but still he was baptized. Matter of fact, John the Baptist came to Jesus and was like, listen, I can't baptize you. I need you to baptize me. And Jesus said, no, we got to do this to fulfill all things. What is Jesus saying? I got to humble myself before I'm exalted. And you think that you don't have to humble yourself? I'm telling you now that on the other side of humility is always promotion. And for some of us who are here, we've been too proud and God wants you to leave that pride in the water. For other people, what hinders them from being baptized? Am I preaching to anybody today? <laughs> Y'all look scared in the service. I ain't scared of you, though. They just not all in yet. They just not. And I believe this is the biggest reason why people don't get baptized is because it ain't that serious to you yet. And you, 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 you're kinda, you, you like the fact that at the end of service, we say every head bowed and every eye closed. And you like to pray a prayer that costs you nothing. Oh, yeah, Jesus, come into my heart. And you're right. That's where it starts. That's not where it stops because after you say, Jesus, come into my heart, God is saying, find the pool and let everybody know you love me. Because some of us, we pray prayers without any fruit, without any sacrifice, without any obedience. And it's not that God doesn't believe you. He just wants you to put some action with what you pray. So as soon as you get saved, the next thing you should do is be in the baptism waters. And I'm telling you, there's an anointing There's an anointing on the water. And so why is baptism so important in the Bible? Here's the reason. Because it symbolizes you leaving your old life behind and being identified with the resurrection of Jesus. Why is baptism so important? It symbolically tells all of hell and heaven that you are done with the old you, you're going into the new life in Christ Jesus. Why is baptism important? Because there's an anointing on the waters. Just take my word for this, y'all. I I wanna show you this diagram. Check this out. Pull up my diagram if you can. All three screens. Top one is Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. So he was born in Bethlehem, raised up in Nazareth. He was the perfect lamb of God because Jesus knew absolutely no sin. So he was the perfect lamb to put all of our sin on his body. So we have Jesus. He dies a sinner's death, okay? He is buried in the grave for three days and three nights, all right? Pays the price for our sin, but hell could not hold him because he was held there illegally because he had never sinned. On the third day, he was resurrected with all power in his hand into newness of life. 
That's Jesus. So the second one is us. Everybody say, that's me. That's, me. that's you doing whatever you want to do, living how you, however you want to live, and then you come in contact with the cross. And when you say, Jesus, come into my heart, you are supposed to die to yourself, your old ways, mindsets, and habits. And then you are to be buried with Christ. I know that sounds weird, but it's symbolism. That means that there's something in the water that you're supposed to leave in the water. You're supposed to leave addictions in the water, depression in the water, confusion in the water. Come on, somebody. You're supposed to leave doubt, worry, and fear in the water. You're supposed to leave sickness in the water. There's an anointing on the water. Now, I love the Bible. I'm a Bible nerd. Whenever you look at water, it has a washing component spiritually. But also in Genesis, the Spirit of the Lord hovered on the waters. I believe on the baptism waters, the Holy Spirit hovers on the waters, and he helps you when you come up out of the water, live a life fully for Jesus. Many people are struggling because they miss the baptisms. They don't understand. They think it's just getting wet or getting sprinkled. No, you're buried with Christ. I'm done with me, and then when I come up the same way that I'm identified with his burial, now in the spirit you are now identified with the resurrecting power of Jesus. Listen, and the same power that rose him from the dead now lives on the inside of you. Now overcome every spirit of depression and setback and and whatever's been holding you back because greater is he that's in you than he that is in this world. Are y'all with me today? Now, um, I I wanted to hear Chelsea. Chelsea, can you jump up real quick? Give her a mic. Um, She has a a baptism story that I would love for you guys to hear. Can you give it up for Chelsea as she comes? Hi. Can you share with whatever? Yes. So for let those. Me, let me turn your mic on. All right. It's on. Hello. Can you hear me? Let me see. Mic number one. Praise God. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. All right. Hey. Hey. So um, my story is I was a flight attendant living in Dallas, Texas, and in May of 2021, I got what I thought was a really bad ear infection. So going to three doctors, I was diagnosed with something called sudden deafness. Um, So I actually had lost 80% of my hearing in my right ear for no reason um, and was considered legally deaf. Being a flight attendant, I couldn't work anymore. I decided to quit my job um, and move here to be closer to family and kind of figure out what next steps would be. So in November of 21, I moved to Orlando found a live church that same month, and in February of 21, or 22, I came to the Wednesday night healing prayer. I was also brought up in a Baptist church, so I didn't really understand it. To be completely honest, I didn't believe in it, um, but I figured everyone was talking about it, so I would give it a shot. It couldn't hurt. Um, And while these ladies were praying over me, this warmth went through my ear that was indescribable, and I walked out of this building with probably 50% of my hearing back. So something was starting to happen. After a few days, uh, the the sickness came back, the fullness was back in my ear, I wasn't feeling well, um, but I knew something had happened during that prayer. Um, So moving forward, they announced that we would be doing baptisms on Easter of 22, and I knew I had to get baptized, but I didn't really know why. Um, I'd been baptized when I was 14, I thought I've already done it, but something was just saying, take this step, and just see. So Easter Sunday last year, I was baptized, and when I came out of the water, my healing was fully restored. The fullness was gone. There was no ache. There was no pain. And every day since, I have never had an earache. I have never had any pain. So when I tell you that there is healing in the water, there is freedom in the water, please Trust me, if if it happened for me, he'll do it for you. Just take that step of obedience. Come on, somebody. Did you guys hear what she just said? So the Bible talks about the deaf being able to hear again. Don't take that as a coincidence. Deaf are being able to hear again. And her healing happened in the waters. As she came out of the water, God confirmed his word in her life. And now she has 100% hearing again in both ears. To God be the glory. Come on, somebody, give God praise. There's an anointing on the waters. There's just something about baptism and just saying yes to Jesus and what he tells us to do, even sometimes when we we don't understand it, we don't get it. In closing, I'm gonna give you eight things you must know about water baptism. Eight things you must know for note takers, let's go. 
Number one, water baptism is not salvation, but it should directly follow your salvation. How do you get saved? You get saved by believing and confessing that Jesus is Lord. Turning your back on sin, not saying you're gonna be perfect, but say, I'm done with me, I put my faith in Jesus. It is about surrenderance. Now, all of the works, coming to church, giving to God, those are works. You can't do the works to get saved, but after you get saved, you should do the works. One of the works, the first work, is to get water baptized. Number two, water baptism is not a sprinkling, but it is an immersion. It is in the name, all right? The definition of baptism means to dip, dunk, cover, immerse, cover wholly in. Number three, water baptism is not for infants, babies, or kids that do not have repentant faith, okay? So don't push your kids into water baptism. Talk to them about water baptism until they understand that they are saved because of the grace of God. And after they understand that, then make sure they understand water baptism is an outward sign of that inward transaction. Number four, water baptism is for spiritual identification. You want to be identified with the new life in Christ Jesus. But before you're identified with the new life, you need to be identified with the baptism burial waters. Number five, water baptism is not a suggestion. It is a command of God. Okay. Now, Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, and this is our scripture for the next six to 12 months. We'll talk about it next week. It says, go and make disciples of all nations right? Read it. And it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son. So this is a command, not that you just get baptized, but then you go do some baptizing. I double dog dare you to fill up your pool, minister to your neighbors and get the baptizing people because it ain't the preachers that need to do the baptizing. I'm not talking about one baptism. I'm talking about all three baptisms. You need to be baptized and then you need to go baptizing. And we're going to take this seat. Oh my God, we have church so jacked sometimes. The church is not here just to tickle our fancy so we can feel good about something we did at the beginning of the week. We are here to equip the saints as the army of the Lord so we can go to the nations, the nations. I'm talking about the nations. You see wars and rumors of wars, they need Jesus. We are to go to the nations. You are anointed for the nation. And we're gonna get you ready, okay? We're gonna get you ready. So number six, water baptism is a public declaration of your faith. Some of you all are closet Christians. It's time for you to come out of the closet. So your Christianity is not supposed to be just between you and the Lord. It's just a private thing. It starts privately with the prayer, but it should get public right away. And so what the baptism pool is, is an opportunity for you to let everybody know that you're in love with God and you don't care who knows it. Number seven, <laughs> number seven water baptism is an initial first step towards spiritual maturity and holiness. I believe after 20 years of ministry, the reason that many people are carnal, the reason that many people are having a hard time maturing spiritually is they miss a baptism. We need all three baptisms, and I believe we need to shorten the distance. I I'm sorry if we have it too sporadically. We just do it every quarter. Right now, I'm in prayer with my team about how can we do baptisms every Sunday. It might not be as elaborate as it is right now. Maybe it's in the back of the building, but I'm telling you, we need to shorten the distance between salvation and baptism. Not just baptism of water, baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you bring these 3,000 people that are coming to the church, when you take them through growth track, bring them to midweek. And so at midweek, what we have every Wednesday night, we pray for the sick over here at the end of every service. So we do 20, 30 minutes of Bible study, then we pray for each other, then we pray for the sick, and then we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where we lead people in this third baptism to receive power and also their prayer language. This ain't for a few gifted people. This is, this is artillery that every believer needs. Hmm. Number eight, water baptism is a type of covenant ceremony that we all need. Mark my words, covenant ceremony. Say it with me, covenant ceremony. Tabitha and I, we've been married for 24 years, and I always joke and say it's been the best 22 years of my life. The first two years was absolutely horrible, but now she got herself together and things are a whole lot better, praise God. <laughs> I tell that joke everywhere, I think it's hilarious. 24 years ago, in New Hope Baptist Church, July 3rd, 1999, I stood before a preacher and I made a vow to my wife she made a vow to me, and it went something like sickness or health, rich, poor, till death does its part, something like that, right? 
And then I took, this is my original ring. <clears throat> and she put it on my finger, okay? And at that moment, we were married and I also had a sign of my marriage, okay? But when I first got married, I was 21 years old and I was in college still and all of my friends were single. And I remember having this on and back in the day, 24 years ago, it was super bright. It's dull now, but back in the day, it was like, it was almost like I had a spotlight on my finger. I would go to the grocery store and I felt like people were just looking at my finger. And I was so embarrassed that I was young and I was married that I would take my ring off and I would hide it. And I would go out with all my single friends and I was married because we had a ceremony, but I didn't want other people to know. <laughs> I was married because I said I loved her, but my love wasn't big enough to go public yet. I wanted to fit in with everybody else. I didn't want people to laugh at me and question me. And so even though I was married, I took my ring off. Some of you all do Jesus like that. You pray the prayer of salvation and you're married to him. You have a relationship with him, but you don't want your coworkers to know. You don't want your family to know. You don't want the persecution and the hate. You don't want those things. So what you do is that you're a Christian all by yourself, but your Christianity was never supposed to be under a bushel. It was supposed to be a light that's set on a hill that cannot be hid for all of the world to see which direction to go. So now, 24 years in the game, I want everybody to know I'm married. I got a wife. Don't DM me. Don't think I'm looking at you because I'm not. I love a woman named Tabitha Ann. Her maiden name was Fitzgerald. She took my name. Now it's Clay to praise God. I don't want anybody else. I'm not interested in anybody else. I'm not desiring in anybody else. I don't have a fancy for anybody else. My heart, come on somebody. My heart is given to a woman named Tabitha. And I want the world to know now. I, I got a podcast called Doing Life with Ken and Tabitha. I thought about leaving her off and just putting <laughs> Doing Life with Ken, but I'm going to bring her along with me so everybody in the world can know yeah. that this is my good thing. Yeah. This is my favor of the Lord. I don't want to hide it from anybody. Come on. But what about you and Jesus? Come on now. He is your good thing. Yeah. He's the one that rose from the dead, forgiving you for all of your ratchetness and how crazy you used to be, still has a calling on your life, still has purpose for you, is even working things in the unseen arena on your behalf right now. Come on, somebody. He's filled with grace. He's filled with mercy. I'm glad somebody understands. And I want the world to know. I don't want to just pray a prayer. I want the world to know my heart belongs to Jesus. Yeah. I'm in love with a savior. Yeah. He's not a dead deity. No. He's a risen king and he's alive and here on today. Somebody say amen. amen. Anyway, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life today if you so choose. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, those of you all who are online, um, thank you for tuning in. I forgot you were there, but love you. Um, every head bowed, every eye closed. You don't have to be, listen, you don't have to be perfect to be forgiven. You don't have to be a perfect person. You don't, but you do need to surrender. If you could get your life together without God, you wouldn't need God. The order of events is you give your heart to Jesus and he's gonna help you with all the mess that you're facing. It's about humility. It's about turning away from what you want to do for what he wants to do. And I believe there's many people here who are ready to take that step. I would love to lead you in this five second prayer that will change your eternal address, that your name is already written in the book of life. It will be blotted out if you miss this moment. It's already there because he's already chose you. He already loves you. He already has a plan for you. And all you got to do is step into it. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you and you say, Pastor, pray for me, I want to be right with God today. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want to be saved. On the count of three, please lift up your hand bold and high and just wave at me, then you can put it down. All over the building, that's you and online, please lift up your hand in one, two, three. Right now, bold, all over the building. Say, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you, I see your hand and 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 your hand. Anybody else? It's not too late. If you should have lifted your hand, but you didn't, please just lift it up right now. Say, Pastor, thank you. Anybody else? All up, thank you, sir. I see your hand. Anybody else? Thank you. I see your hand and your hand and your hand. Anybody else? Just that's a surrendered position. That's all that it is. 
And watch this, nobody prays alone, we're all gonna pray together. Are you ready? Nobody prays alone, but I want you to mean this from your heart. Say this, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. From this day forward, I surrender my will to your will, my ways for your ways. I turn my back on sin and the world, and I want you. Thank you for dying on a cross with me on your mind. I'm identified with you now. I'm born again. I'm saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it and He illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in a live church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right. If you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, it'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow into the ministry of a live church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.